We just want to say thank you for another opportunity to come into your presence. The Bible says in your presence is the fullness of joy and at your right hand is a pleasure forever. Every time we come, we are expectant because we know that we are in for good time. Joy and pleasure that surpasses any pleasure that the act can offer. So this afternoon we just want to say thank you, Lord. It's a privilege. It's a honor that we are not taking lightly that day. Take all glory today in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we ask of you to speak to us yourself in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I release this vessel of clay unto you this morning. And I pray, Lord, use this vessel and take all the glory. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we are praying. Amen. Hallelujah. We may have a seat. We may have a seat. Thank you, choir. Thank you, Brother Allah. Allah, Barah. And you love to be too. And you love to be There is no like our God. We serve a God that is great, that is mighty. You cannot describe the, the magnitude, the magnificence of this God. The book of um, Philippians, I think is the one that tells us about the depth and the width of the love that God has for us. We serve a God that is not limited by anything. He is the owner of everything. He is the creator of everything. He is God by himself. Hallelujah. That is the question. Thank you, Father. Church, happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Everyone looking gorgeous. Everyone looking wonderful. Mama Trish, glory to God for a new lease of life. Glory to God for a new lease of life. Because when God gives you a new lease of life, then you begin to shine. Amen. You begin to shine because you are in connection with the one that shines. It's the one that shines. It's the, it's the, it's the morning, the, 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 the brightness of the day. There is no like it. It's the God of glory. I will celebrate God in your life. We celebrate God. We celebrate God. As Pastor Kola said, it's, it's an amazing thing, you know, to serve God in your old age. So people, you know, like that parable of the of the of the master that that um, employed workers in his field. The Bible says he employed them, and he said, "I'm employing you this morning, and I'm going to pay you certain amount of money." And then. He, got, he went and got some of them. They agreed on a certain amount of money. I will pay you £10 for this job. I'll pay you £10 for the job. And then he went again. About afternoon time, he went and called another one. He promised to pay them the same amount of money. When it was evening, like few minutes to the end of the, of the, of the day, of the job, he went and called another one. And he promised them the same amount of money that like he promised to the one that he working with his money. So when you have the grace that it is at your old age that he found you, that is indescribable. It's a blessing that cannot be quantified. We celebrate God in your life. She was almost 70 when she came to the Lord. Amen. And some people have been born again since they were 15. The same grace that has seen them through is the one that is seen a seven years old woman through. Hallelujah. That he will give you glory. I pray that each and every one of us will not fail this much. Time. We are in this field for a lifetime. We will not disappoint him. Regardless of how young you are when he called you, you are going to make it to the very end. And the voice of welcome faithful servant will be ours in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Because why? Regardless of how long we spend here, eternity is more than that. Regardless of how young, how long we spend in this place, we're going to spend a lot more in eternity. Blessing and worshiping Him. Amen. Amen. Today, the topic that we're going to talk about is a topic that I know many preachers will want to run away from. And I can I just tell you. Confess to you as well that I tried running away from this. Yeah, I did try running away from it. 
probably not deliberately, but I found myself not going to talk about it. And the message that I've been preparing since the beginning of the week was completely different until about 11 p.m. last night. I knew that that I've been preparing was not the message. You know, you just know when the Spirit of God is in you, you know that that's not the message. And I knew. And I was looking at the time, I was feeling sleepy. I need to sleep. But if I came here to speak what he didn't want me to speak, uh, God forbid that. It's about giving to God money. We're talking money this morning. Amen. Money first, and then you give whatever you give unto your maker, the one that made you. You know, when we just come, they're thinking, oh, if I begin to talk about money now, they may think um, I'm the one that's going to spend the money, especially when it's a pastor or the church or something, they're thinking, oh, will people understand that this money is for the work of God? Will they not? Because many preachers, many pastors actually have abused the money. They are serving money instead of serving the one that called them. And that has given money a kind of power that it doesn't have. And that's why brethren are scared every time we hear money. It's like, oh, they have started the game. They are going to ask us to empty our pockets. They are going to ask us to give this one. Brethren, today, let's just relax. Yeah? Amen. I want us to talk with you to the book of um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'll read quickly verses 6 to 15. It's a bit long, but that's where the message is coming from today. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 from verses 6 to 15. I'm reading from the NIV version. It says, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work as it is reason. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. I want you to note that word. It will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You are sowing money, but it's going to enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So what you are reaping is not just money. You are reaping an enlarged righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the need of the lost people, but it's also overflowing in many is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of your service by which you have proved yourselves. Others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. And for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else and in their prayers for you, their acts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gifts. I know it's a bit long, that passage. But on its own, it's quite explanatory. We actually can take that picture, scripture, read it to yourself, and allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you, and then we're going on. But I'm here today to ask to, you know, to, to expand it. Amen. We need to understand that given. If you follow that scripture that we just read, Giving is an act of love. You give anybody anything at all. When it comes from your heart, it's because you love the person. You don't give to somebody you hate. 
You don't give to somebody you despise. You give because you love. I mean, imagine, you know, I'm going to use that daddy and mommy as an example. It was their 30th anniversary, you know, uh, this week that has just come past. 38, 38 and years anniversary of being married. You know, that's amazing. Stay sleeping and waking up beside the same person for 38 years. Ah, it is a lot. <laughs> it is a lot. We celebrate you, daddy and mommy. We celebrate you. We say that God will increase his grace in your life. Jesus. They are worthy examples. The examples that we all should emulate. Amen. I'm sure mommy told a story. I think it was uh, it was at sixth birthday or something. Maybe I don't know how I was privileged to hear the story about how daddy was uh, toasting her when he was asking her out when he was chasing her. You know, when he was working. She was in the school of nursing and he was working. Am I right, daddy? He was working somewhere in the automobile, mechanical work, and everything like that. He was pursuing her, and there was a sister who was a friend of hers or something, and this one is saying, ah, perfect mommy now, you have, to, you have to agree with my brother, I agree with my brother. Anyway, during that time, daddy would have done something. I wasn't there. <laughs> but I'm sure daddy must have packed some wrapped gifts, something very nice. I have to entice this girl. Ah, this girl has to be mine. Maybe as soon as he set his eye on her, he thought, ah, this is she. Ah, this must not slip off my finger. Come on. And then he's looking for what he can do to woo her. And today, 38 years after, they are waxing stronger. Yeah. That happened because he gave. I wasn't there, but I'm sure I'm not. Not since at that time. Ah, those girls were there in Nigeria. I, I know that nurses, you know, guys were chasing them, mama. <laughs> guys that are chasing them, you know, in those days you have to be correct guy for you to chase a nurse. So the guy will be thinking, okay, what can I package to give to her? And I'm, I'm sure each and every one of us that are married here will have a story, a history of how we chase, or we chase, we would, or we would. We gave because we love. You give because you love. But there is someone that gave more than what anybody can ever imagine. He gave his all. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world and he gave her his only begotten son. His giving surpassed anything any one of us can imagine in our hearts to give. We don't see God. If they ask you to sacrifice your first son or your second son, on your last song, so that's something. Would you not kill yourself there first? You will want to die there first, and that is not happening. I take me, I'm the one to take. They don't take me, not him, not her. Amen. Because of how precious our children are to us. But this God in his majesty, because he knows that the only way to save you and I is to give something as an exchange for our sinfulness. And nothing else can do the job. No one else can do the job. I'm sure if God has another way by which he can atone and do the appropriation, he would have done it without giving his son. But there was no other way. For God to appease God, because it is God that is appeasing himself, do we understand that? For God to remain just and holy, how do you determine an holy God when he is condoning sin and iniquity? And the only way to take the sin and the iniquity away is for sacrifice of a pure, sinless person. And there is no human being qualified for that. Then he has to give himself. We will do this. My son, you will go and you will do this. Yes. Pastor Kola mentioned, you know, during the Holy Communion, the work that Jesus did. We've seen in film. We've seen how he was dragged, how he was beaten, how he was molested, how he was harassed. They spat on his face. They called him name. Brother Allah led us to pray prayer against shame. Jesus was ashamed. They made him a laughing stock. For what? For you and I. 
God gave his best. So why when they now ask us to give money, we begin to check our pockets. We begin to scratch our head. We begin to think as if it is a big deal that they are asking us to give. Who gave you that in the first instance? There is nothing that you have that was not given to you. Book of John tells us when John, when Jesus was performing miracles and the disciples of John, they came to him. They said, this man is doing miracles. What is going on? And John the Baptist told them, no one can receive anything except it be given from above. You have those, that house, those properties, that beautiful job, those children, that beautiful life, that your wardrobe, that you are proud of, whatever it is that you have, it is, it has been given unto you. Really? And now I'm not talking about believers alone, even unbelievers. If they have gone to, to get money from rituals, if God has said no to it, you know it will not happen. There is nothing anybody receive that has not been given unto us. The greatest giver gave us his all. Then we should not hesitate to give whatever we need to give to make him happy. It's asking for your time. I'm going to work. I have to work. I have this shit to do. And I'm giving you this thing to do in the job. Ah, how can I make that one? I can't make that one. I've been working all day. I've been doing this all. Who gave you the health in your body to work in the first place? Bring this money. They have this work to do in the work of God. Ah, eh, I plan this holiday. I plan to give this uh, person this one. And you begin to think about yourself first. When the giver of the gift is asking. Hallelujah. He's the giver. He's the greatest giver. It is the greatest giver. No one can surpass God in giving. You know anybody that can surpass God in giving? No one. No one can surpass God in giving. He is the giver. I'll sing a song to you, but I'm sorry I do this all the time, but I'll interpret it. <laughs> Oh, what is to give what he has not committed 
into your hands. This is where we get the story of the widow's mind. You hear the widow's mind, widow's mind. This is where the story comes from. Just then, he looked up and saw the rich people dropping offerings in the collection plate. Then he saw a poor widow put in two pennies. He said, the plain truth is that this widow has given by far the largest offering today. All these others made offerings that they will never miss. She gave extravagantly what she couldn't afford. She gave her all. She gave extra vagantly that which she could not afford. You know, if somebody comes to you and asks you to borrow their money, you look at your purse. Ah, maybe you only have like a hundred pounds left. And the person said, borrow them uh, 70 pounds. And then you think, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. What is left is less than the 70 pounds. You just look at the person and say, sorry, I can't afford it. Isn't that it? Sorry, I cannot afford it. I can't afford it. And then that's it. You can't afford it. But this is a woman. You see, when I was reading this scripture, actually a few weeks ago, God opened my eyes to see this scripture. And then, what's interesting is that God is looking at every act of service that we do. Does that make sense to somebody? Every act of service. They call you to do something in church. God is looking not only at what you are doing. He's looking at the act with which you are doing it. Somebody came to ask you for support. God is looking at the way that you are giving the support to the person. Are you doing it grudgingly? Are you doing it so that you can be seen by people? In the house of God, they call you to do something, then you are the boss, you are running up and down, you are doing this one, yes, I'm the one doing it, I'm the one doing it. The one that called you sees the younger sense. Am I making sense? The God that you are serving, he sees beyond the service that you are rendering. People may not know. I come on the altar and I give the word and it sounds like, oh, God is with that sister and everything like that. The one that called me is looking beyond the word that are coming out of my mouth. He's seeing through to the depth of my soul and he's seeing the spirit with which I am delivering the service. How did I know this? Jesus was watching when people were coming to give gifts. He was watching. Nothing that we do goes beyond his eyes. And then, he said to the people around him, look at them. Look at these people that are given. This one. This one. This one, they are very rich. They have so much in their bank account. They have a lot reserved somewhere. But out of that, they brought like a, you know, they call for giving in church and they bring like 100 pounds, 200 pounds, and they flaunt it. And of course, the pastor is so excited because somebody gave 1,000 pounds, 2,000 pounds, and they are now saying, yeah, the person that God has just used to be a blessing to us today is a, a, a brother so and so, and sister so and so. They have given us graciously and generously a sum of 5,000 pounds. And everybody stand up and they clap. This is good. And there is somebody in the congregation. Who had only five pounds? In fact, that is all she has. But the need in the house of God is so serious that everyone has to give. And then she took all that she has. That is the closest to what God did, giving his son. She took all that she has. If I perish, I perish. If I go hungry, I go hungry. If I lack nothing, I don't have nothing. 
for this cause of the work of God, I have given this. And then she gave it. The one that sees beyond the amount that everyone sees knows that she gave the most. She gave what she could not afford. So my point is, God won't ask you what he has not given you. It's the heart with which you give it that matters. Amen. The act with which you give it is what matters. In rounding up, because I've only got five minutes now. Hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm going to leave us in the church. And I'm not saying this to just you. Brethren, trust me, this money, this message is for me as well. I do the work of God. I serve God in different capacity. I spend my own money by the grace of God to do things for God. But can I do more for God? Do I have a bigger capacity for the things of God? Can I actually do more to this assembly that we are? 